He is risen. He is risen oh, we've got it now, don't we? God bless you. Welcome. If you are joining us in house or online, thank you so much. Um, I am so thrilled to be with you here on Easter Sunday. And we're going to do a couple of things today. Uh, I'm going to answer a few questions uh, about Easter. Is that fair enough? Why do we celebrate Easter? Why is this such a big deal? Uh, but before we do that, I just want to thank all of the volunteers that we have on an Easter Sunday and all the guys that showed up yesterday to have the Easter egg hunt. How much fun was that, everybody? It was a blast. So many kids, so many eggs. There's still one golden egg outstanding, which blows my mind. So if you're watching online, you got the golden egg, you know who you are. Bring it. There's a cool prize. But what we have on Easter is an amazing day where so many people are inclined to come to church. But why do we celebrate Easter? There's a lot of different things you could say about it, but uh, if you want to follow along in your notes today, uh, we're going to camp out in, in basically the end of the book of John. And if you want to follow in your notes, uh, Easter is the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I want to make it as simple as I can this morning. This is not something that is overbloated or overcomplicated. We serve a risen Savior. He raised from the dead. And so often we talk about his death, his burial. We talk about the cross. And, and I'll tell you, even on Easter Sundays, a lot of the times I will talk a lot about what Jesus did on the cross. But today is a day to celebrate the resurrection. Uh, today is a day to celebrate that he came back from the dead and today I want to talk about why that's really important. There are over 500 witnesses that saw him raised from the dead. They ate with him. They drank with him. They saw him. Many of them saw him ascending from the top of a hill up into heaven. And then they wrote about it. It's remarkable. So today I want to talk about Resurrection Sunday. What happened on that first Sunday that first Resurrection Sunday. On John chapter 20, starting in verse 1 today, it says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Can you imagine? It's not even light yet. She comes to the tomb. She's going to do all the things for the body that didn't have time to do a few days before because of the high holy Sabbath day for the Jews. So they only had to just kind of do a quick burial, put them in there. And she comes early in the morning. She's going to fix all those things, make it right, give them a proper burial. And it's too late because he's gone. <laughs> Consider that. Jesus Christ never got a proper burial. <laughs> They never did all the things, which is beautiful because he didn't need it. He wasn't going to stay there. But it was early on the first day of the week. I want you to know this. Jesus was resurrected while your life was still dark. He was resurrected before you need, knew that you needed someone to be resurrected for you. He rose from the dead while you were still living with all your mistakes with all your failures, with all your past, in your darkest time was when Jesus was already doing all the things for you that you didn't know that you needed. This is what is really important about the gospel, that we do not earn our way to the table of the resurrection. You're sitting in here with a group of people today that are extremely flawed. Amen. Amen. The guy on stage is included in that. <laughs> We're all extremely flawed. But the beauty of it is, before we knew we needed a Savior, Jesus was already about the business of saving us. He was already doing all the things that we couldn't do for ourselves. So in verse 2, so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple. And I love how John writes his gospel, because John is just the, this guy in real life. He says, Simon Peter, he talks about Peter, and then he goes, well, you know, and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. John is talking about himself right there, okay? He's not talking about somebody else. Anytime you see the disciple that Jesus loved in the book of John, John is saying, you guys know I'm his favorite, right? 
basically that's what it is. And he, he was sitting at, next to him at the, the, the Last Supper real close to Jesus. And John were really best friends. John was the only one when Jesus was crucified that went all the way to the cross with him. Everybody else flew. They, they, they took off because they were terrified. So maybe he really is Jesus' favorite. <laughs> And that might offend some people. Like, Jesus had favorites? Absolutely, Jesus had favorites. And parents in here, you're like, well, that's just wrong because, like, I love all my kids equally. Yeah, you do. <laughs> sure. But everybody knew it. It wasn't like it was a secret. John even wrote it in his gospel. He said, so Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Now, I want you to think about those words. If they were following Jesus because they knew he was going to die and then be raised from the dead three days later, she would have come and said, it's exactly like he said. That's not what she said. She said, I don't know where his body is. The people that followed Jesus the closest were not confident in the resurrection until after the resurrection. They didn't get it. They didn't understand. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running. And it was a race. Because the other disciple outran Peter. <laughs> Remember, this is John's gospel, right? He's like, I beat him. I beat Peter to the tomb. And reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. I don't know if it was shock, reverence, awe, confusion. I don't know what stopped John from walking on into the tomb. But Peter never had any kind of compulsions like that that ever stopped him from anything. So <laughs> then Simon Peter came along uh, behind him and went straight into the tomb. <laughs> Pushed his way right through. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, don't forget that. He wants you to know. He beat Peter in the race. Who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. This is a really curious statement because what did he believe? Was this the moment where John started realizing all those things that Jesus was telling us, maybe I need to go back and reread what I wrote. Because maybe I missed something. Because who would steal a body from a, from a tomb? Who would roll away a two-ton stone, come in, steal a body, but bother to unwrap the body first? This is a weird theft. If you're stealing the body, you go in, you take everything and run. But the linens were, were nicely, neatly folded, and, and the, the, the cloth that covered his face was just lying exactly where his face was. Who would do that? And yet... In verse 9, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Isn't that amazing? They're at the tomb, and they still don't under... It's an empty tomb. There's the cloth laying right there exactly where his body was. Who would leave that there? And they still couldn't process. Well, of course. And we look at this as a modern church and we look back and well, of course it was like that. And to them, they're going, I have no idea what's going on right now. And how important Jesus' resurrection is. Because see, we talk about how he died and forgave us of our sins, but how often do we really talk about why he rose? See, if we only knew that Jesus died, how would we know why he did? He came back to tell us. Because when Jesus died, they all went back to their day jobs. 
They, didn't, they, they weren't going to follow him as a martyr past the grave. They were not going to continue to follow his teachings and love one another and do all those things that he taught them. They were just going to go back to their jobs and go, well, that was a fun run. So what they did was, when they get to the tomb, they still haven't realized why Jesus died. And the reason why is because there were lots of messiahs during that time. It was like an industry of messiahs. There were guys constantly going around the countryside claiming to be messiah because there would be people following them, giving them money. That doesn't sound familiar. The more things change, the more they don't. It's, like, it's not like history repeats itself. It's like history is repeating itself. And there were many messiahs that died claiming to be the messiah. The one that was promised to rescue humanity, to rescue Israel. And the amazing thing about Jesus is he died like them, except he came back. That changes things. And the resurrection is way more important than his death. Because if he didn't rise from the grave then we would have just thought, well, he's another imposter just like the rest of them. The reason people are sitting in this room and online all across the world right now is because he rose from the dead and people have been talking about it for 2,000 years. So he died to forgive our sins. He bled, he died our death. And here's the beauty of it. He goes, well, now that that's done, I can come back. Think about it. He died in our place, but he was the one that wouldn't stay dead. He came back. He lives again to ensure our eternal life. It is not just that he died to forgive us. He's now alive so that we can live with him. And this is a beautiful thing because in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul tells the Corinthian church this. He says, if only for this life we have hope in Christ. So if we just serve Jesus in this life and then when we die, it's all over. We are of all people most to be pitied. I think I agree with that, don't you? If we're only doing this and then when we die and it's over, whoops. But Christ has indeed been raised from the the dead. Paul's still surrounded by people that have seen him alive. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What does that mean? That just means simply he was the first to rise from the dead so that all the rest of us can also. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And this is a remarkable thing because I think there's so many people around the world that believe in something after this life. If you poll people, if you ask people, you're going to get really high numbers of, do you believe there's something after this life? And most people will say yes. But the question is, what? Isn't it? That's a world debate. But the the point that the scripture makes is, if there's no resurrection, then there's no point. We don't come up here and celebrate Jesus and sing about him because he died. We come up here and sing about him and preach about him because he's alive. If there's no resurrection, then there's no point. If there's not something after this life, then what's the point? Everybody's like, wow, I came to Easter service and the pastor's a nihilist. God bless you. Have a great day. Hope you're all encouraged. We can leave now. (laughs) If there's no resurrection, then there's no point. And that was the entire point. Because when Jesus died, all of his disciples left. They were done. John watched him die, and John even was at the point where, well, I followed him all the way to the cross, and I guess this is it. I'm taking care of his mom now. 
But what I want to do today is really quickly, I want to ask three questions. Concerning faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I think these three questions go down to the core of what every single one of us at some point feels as we're searching for Jesus. The first question is this, what if I'm searching but lost? What if I'm searching but lost? What if I honestly want to figure out what is after this life? What if I honestly want to figure out, okay, what is the point of living? What is the whole reason that I'm here on this earth to begin with? What if I'm honestly searching but I just feel lost in a whirlwind? In verse 11, it says, Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And this is after Peter and John have left. I'm sorry, Peter and the disciple that Jesus loved had left. I want to besperch you, John. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look in the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been. One at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away. She said, what do you mean, why am I crying? My Lord was slaying right there and they've taken his body and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. How many of us don't realize that Jesus is already working behind the scenes in our lives? We just haven't recognized him yet. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Understand this, Jesus doesn't ask questions because he doesn't know things. He asks questions to see if we know things. Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener. (laughs) I should love this. Like, why am I having a conversation with the, the tomb gardener right now? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Look, we don't have to, nobody has to get in trouble about this. If you just tell me where the body is, we'll go take care of it. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him. Now look at this. She wasn't facing him, talking to him, because in her grief, in her loss, in her pain, she was lost in the moment, not understanding where he was. He was right beside her, and it wasn't until she heard her name that she turned and looked and realized who he was. She turned to him and cried in Aramaic, Rabbi, which means teacher. Sometimes we're so lost in all the craziness of the world that we're not listening for God giving those personal things that are drawing us to Him. But if you quiet yourself, I promise you they're there. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And there's all kinds of crazy theological debate over this one verse. I think it's very simple. He's saying, look, we don't have time. i got to go to the Father. We don't have time to just right here, right now, just do nothing but this. There's a lot more people that need to be told before I leave. So don't just hang on right here. Take what you've just seen and go. Go tell some people. But here's what I want to tell you. If you have that question, you know, what if I'm searching, but I just feel lost. I feel lost in my emotion. I feel lost in the world. I feel lost in my schedule. I feel lost in all the things that are going on that distract me from this honest search. I just feel like maybe I haven't had time for it, or maybe I haven't made time for it, or my family's going through something. Keep searching until you find Jesus. Don't stop. Keep pushing through all those things. Keep searching. Because the world has no end of things that it will come to distract you with. How many of us just get so busy? And we forget. This is why there's things like Easter that are annual that help us refocus. Keep searching until you find Jesus. And then... Do what he tells Mary to do. Share what you find with others. You know what is one of the most amazing things about finding something? You can solidify what you found by sharing it with others. You can find out more about what you know by talking to others about it. 
It's remarkable. I learned a lot about the Bible before I started teaching the Bible, but I've learned a lot more about the Bible since I began teaching the Bible. If you begin to share your faith with others, or if you share your questions with others, or if you share your struggles with others, you will find Jesus in those places. Second question is this, what if I'm afraid? What if I'm afraid? In John chapter 20, and verse 19, it says, On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, why were they hiding from the Jewish leaders? Well, because Jesus' body went missing, and they were the prime suspects. The Jewish Sanhedrin government was looking for them. The Roman government was looking for them. They were thinking, if these people find us, we are going to be following Jesus to the grave. So they're hiding. They're afraid. Legitimately. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Now, it doesn't say how Jesus got into the room of a locked door. He's Jesus. He rose from the dead. You think getting into a locked room is going to be a problem? After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Why? Because in his hands were holes from nails. In his side was a, a scar where he had been stabbed with a spear. He showed them those things. I'm not a lookalike. Look, I went through it. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. And this is the power of the church. This is the power of what Jesus left for us to empower other people with. And if you're afraid, that's okay. That's an honest question. What if I'm afraid? Fear is a product of the uncertain. I want you to know that. We're afraid of tomorrow because we don't know what tomorrow will bring. We're afraid of a relationship because we don't know what the end of that relationship will be. We're afraid of dying because we don't know what's after this life. We're afraid of jumping out and doing something that's different because, boy, if I do and I land flat on my face, I'm going to feel like a failure. So we fear those things that are most uncertain in our lives. I think that's common to all of us. And if you're not afraid of anything, turn the news on. They'll give you 10 things to be afraid of on the hour, every hour. Doesn't matter what channel. And there's so many uncertainties, but here's the certainty. Jesus died so you don't have to, and he was raised from the dead so that you can have eternal life with him. And then he says something amazing. He goes, forgive people. What? Why? Because there's no fear in forgiveness. When you forgive someone, all the fear and the angst of that relationship goes away. When you forgive people, all those uncertainties don't really matter as much anymore because I've forgiven you. It doesn't matter what you've done. And I want you to know, when you walk in here, this is a place of forgiveness. There is a power in forgiving someone. And there is a power that the church has. In being a forgiving church. It doesn't matter where you came from, but it matters that where you are now and where you're going. It, we forgive your past. It doesn't matter what you've done up to this point, but what we're concerned about is where you're going for all of eternity. Because there's no fear in forgiveness. If you receive the forgiveness that Jesus has for you, then you don't have to fear death because now you know what's after death. Because he died and came back to tell you. So there's two things that I want you to know. If you need forgiveness, repent. That word is very simple. It means you turn the other direction. 
You're headed one direction, you turn the other direction. If you're headed away from Jesus, you turn towards Jesus and say, I want to follow you. It's that simple. So if you need forgiveness, repent. Say, Jesus, I want to follow you. And you know what he does so many times when he would tell people, hey, follow me. And they would say, you know, would you, would you forgive me? He goes, you know what, you're forgiven of all your sins. I will never, there, there's a couple of moments that I remember in ministry and life that, that uh, one, one is ugh, just huge in my mind. Young man came to our college group years ago. You'll be able to meet him actually here next month if you come back. He's going to come speak because now he's uh, a professor uh, sometimes at a, at a Bible college and also preaches <laughs> as a pastor. But I'll never forget, the first time we met him, he came into our college group. He won't have a problem with me sharing this story. <laughs> he came into our college group high as a kite because we have food. <laughs> and that night, the weight of the gospel impacted his life such that he sat and cried the whole service. Sat and talked to me after the service, still just crying. And you could just see all the weight of all the problems and the mistakes that he had made throughout his life. And this kid had some serious problems. You wouldn't know that now looking at him, but he had some serious problems that he was trying to walk away from and escape from in his life. And I remember the moment that I felt the Spirit compel me to look at him, pick his face up and go, I forgive you. He... I don't even know what came upon me in that moment other than the Spirit of God because I didn't know this kid. I just met him. But immediately his whole life changed. All I was letting him know was the power of forgiveness that is in Jesus Christ. And I was just the representative to let him know he was forgiven. So if you walked in here with a lot of heavy baggage today... I forgive you. This church forgives you. Let's move forward. If you need forgiveness, repent. If you need healing, forgive. If someone's hurt you, forgive them. If you've had, and this is, this is going to be one of the hardest things, if a church has hurt you, Let me stand here for just a moment as the representative of every church that's ever hurt anyone. I'm sorry. I have no excuses. I have nothing else to say. I'm sorry. I'm sorry you were hurt. And I pray for your healing that you would forgive. See, the church is the culture of forgiveness and repentance. It takes both. This is a culture that when you walk into this place, we're going to teach you how to follow Jesus. We're not going to ask about your past. And here's the third question, and this is one that I think every single one of us deals with throughout our lives. What if I doubt? What if I doubt? Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. He was the only one left out of that locked room. Don't know where he was hiding, but he's like, I'm not hiding with all of you. Because <laughs> if they find us... I'm with you. That's not good. Thomas had a lot of common sense. So he was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. We give him a hard time for this. We call him Doubting Thomas. That's so messed up. I mean, he preached the gospel 
from Jerusalem, went into other parts of the world, and was martyred for his faith, yet we still call him Doubting Thomas. Well, then you should call me Doubting Cole. We should all put doubting in front of our names at some point in our Christian faith because at some point we're going to go, God, I just don't know. And we can be honest about it. It's being pious about it, acting as if none of us have ever thought that way that turns others away that also doubt. So a week later, his disciples were in the house again. Somehow Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Place your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand, put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you've seen me and you've believed. And then he sets this up for all of us. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And this is what I want to speak into your doubt today. If you have doubts, that's okay. But this is what I want to give you as instruction. Let integrity lead your doubt. Thomas did not look at all of his friends and say, y'all are crazy. He just said, for me, this is what I need. He did not use that as a cudgel. He did not use that as an excuse to just justify what he wanted to do in his life. He did not use his doubt as something to say, well, I just want to walk away from this. He used his doubt as a catalyst to search for the truth. Doubt is not a problem depending on which direction it pushes you. Where does it lead you? And if you have doubts, that's okay. But let me show you how we overcome doubt. Jesus looked at him and said, stop doubting and believe. Doubt is dissolved by reaching out in faith. What does that mean? Well, that means when Jesus says, follow me, You just start following. You might not know exactly where it leads, but you reach out, you reach that first foot out, you start taking those steps, and then you begin to follow him in such a way that you will learn. And here's the thing. The people that begin to follow Jesus usually keep following Jesus. Because he, when you're reaching out to him in your doubt, will continue to prove himself. And here's what I want to leave you with. I know these three questions are not the only questions. But I think they encompass a lot of what we go through when coming to faith. So maybe you're searching, but you feel lost. Maybe today you're afraid of the world, or maybe you're afraid of facing your failures. Maybe you're afraid of saying, okay, I want to commit to this. Or maybe you just have doubts. We're okay with all of that. What I want for you is what I want for these people. Mary, Peter, the disciple that Jesus loved. And even doubting Thomas. What I find in the apostles and what I find in the disciples that followed Jesus until their death, when they were said, deny Jesus and they refused to and they died. Peter was crucified upside down. What I find is not that they had all the answers at the resurrection. What I find is they had a lot of questions. Isn't that great? Because what you need today is not necessarily a lot of answers, but what you need to do is let your questions lead you to Christ Jesus. We all come to faith in Christ the same way with our questions, with our guilt, with our fear, with our doubt, with our shame, with our emotions, with our failures. 
and he wouldn't have it any other way. So would you bow your head in this place? Here, just a moment, we're going to continue one more song of worship. But in this moment, right here, right now, it doesn't matter what your question is. If you're brave enough to say this morning, say, Pastor Cole, I have questions. Would you just lift your hand for just a moment? I want to be able to pray with you before you leave this place today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I see these hands. Today, I want to give you the opportunity to take the first step towards answering some of those questions. And I'll go ahead and tell you, in this life, you're not going to find all the answers because I've been doing this for a long time and I still haven't come across all the answers. But I have come across this answer. He is risen. So in this moment, if we can all pray a prayer together, if this is for you the first time you're saying, you know what, I want to follow Jesus, I want to begin to commit my life to Jesus in this moment, we're going to pray this prayer with you. Father God, Would you repeat after me? Father God, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. I believe that he died. I believe he was buried. But I believe that he is risen. Today I commit to take a step of faith. And follow him. Lead my steps. Love me and my questions. Help me share this with others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want a couple of things before we go back into worship today if you prayed that prayer for the very first time today congratulations if you're online you play, prayed that prayer today that is the first best step of the rest of your life church can we just celebrate that somebody prayed that today come on so here's what you do next in your worship guide there's a connect card on the back of it You just say, I decided to follow Jesus today. Fill that out. Drop that on the kiosk, the the giving kiosk as you go out. If you want to, we have free Bibles for you. Pick up a Bible before you leave. And if today you want to go public with your faith, I know that's quick, isn't it? If you decide, I want to go public with my faith, we're going to sing a song and we're going to baptize some people at the end of that song. And we've got t-shirts for you. If you want to be baptized today, you can meet us at the back and we will go ahead and give you t-shirts and what you need to be baptized today. You don't have to wait on going public with your faith. Would you stand with me today, church? God, I am so thankful for what you're doing. Let's worship him today. If you're being baptized, you can go ahead and make your way to the back and, and we can go ahead and get you guys ready for baptism. Let's worship him.